here with um, a Doom legend, Mike of Yob. We started talking about the music industry, and you were mentioning, like, look, let's face it, Yob has cachet in this particular market when it comes to music. I mean, you're one of the heavies, right? And you were kind of almost in our conversation, kind of giving me a counterpoint to that. And I thought it would be interesting, uh, you know, to maybe place in our interview. The counterpoint in what sense? The counterpoint in the sense that Yob's really big. And you came out and said, well, you know what, Yob's not really as big as you might think. I mean, realistically, I mean, when I think Yob started out, and I think a lot of bands were of the same mindset where, you know, it wasn't a popularity contest and there was, we were all very much in obscurity and kind of playing for each other in a way and then for the handful of people that appreciated what these bands were doing um, the early Hellhound Records bands and you know that whole kind of scene that was happening um, and uh, so the fact that any of it came as far as it did I think is kind of mind-boggling to all of us that are involved in it and we all kind of are surprised that heavy music has become so much more uh, legitimate in a broader sense where like very jaded uh, music critics and writers from larger publications are starting to clue into what these bands are doing and see it as artistically sound and so on one hand it's like there's been a growing popularity of which bands um, are becoming more and more well known and respected but at the same time, it's also like a very super grand minimum wage living. I mean, it's, you know, it's still a lot of struggle and struggling to pay bills. And, Do you get a um, tour bus? No, fuck no. There you go. Actually, you know what? One thing that I really <laughs> was concentrating on this thing yeah. was um, I'm trying as hard as possible what I create to get the message out that if you think these guys are wealthy doing what they love it doesn't happen man they're not Aerosmith no. it's Yob now they have thousands upon thousands of fans but you know that's what the music industry is today which kind of takes me to my next question All right. um, let's be realistic um, a whole generation of people got turned on to Yob by downloading your mp3s from the net sure man I mean the first time I ever heard Slayer was on a mixtape I mean, the first time I ever heard Oz, you know, that old 80s of metal Of course, band, with know, the bald I mean, singer. Yes. Of course. I mean, th those were all came to me on mixtapes, you know. you, That's, music has a life of its own, you know. It has a life of its own, and you record something, and it's it's your creation. But when you send it out into the world, it, it, it's like planting seeds, you know. It just, it sprouts up in ways that you can't control. Mm -hmm. you, you can't maybe to a certain degree, but anyone who tries to control it ends up driving themselves crazy. And then they end up becoming the bitter, you know, almost had this or could have had that, or trying to control who's downloading it or not. And man, it's just, you know, the people, I just know how I am, which is I've been turned on to plenty of burned CDs, plenty of download links. And if I hear something that like moves me, I'm from the era that I have to have the material. You know, I want the vinyl or I want the CD or I want what the cassette or whatever the fuck it is, because Do I. Do you want the MP3? I will have the MP3s on my iPod because I used to be one of those guys who would walk around with a backpack to carry the 50 CDs that I might want to listen to that day. That's all of us, you know? man. And so. It's like having an iPod is incredibly ideal. You know, it's like, all right, well, I'll have 75 records in my pocket. So, yeah, I like MP3s. They're fine. You know, it's Will not you like... buy I, them is the question. Will you purchase if I can't, If I can't find it anywhere else. So, in other words, like, or if I can't, it's like, all right, I can wait for the, um, for like, a, oh, what's a good example of something? Um, the new High on Fire? No, no, nothing like that, because you can get that. If I can go out and buy it, I'm not Internal interested in buying the MP3, but like... Internal Void was, uh, they just released their first vinyl. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's some stuff that you just, you can't find, um, 
on anything unless you go onto eBay and then you're going to pay 200 bucks or 300 bucks for a vinyl or 75 or 80 bucks. But if that band does an iTunes release too, and if that's the way I can get it and still support the band and not pay an exorbitant price, you know, mm -hmm. then I will do that, you know, but you know, still supporting them. Um, I get the music and then I just kind of hope that I find it someday, you know? Well, it brings me to my story a little bit when it comes to this, because the first thing I observed in doing a few interviews is that there's a good bunch of you around our age, you know, 30s, 40s, that mentioned the mixtape. Yeah. Nobody seemed to have a problem with the mixtape. Now, you know, MP3s are pretty similar. That's yeah, absolutely that. true. Okay. The second thing is that, look, I, I've stolen tons of music. I go to Blogspot and I download every, uh, for example, every obscure psychedelic band from the late 60s. Yeah. But what it's led to, however, is that I now know who 13th Floor Elevators are right. and I've bought their records. I now know who Comus is yeah. and I bought the vinyl. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I realize, I realize, let's say from a musician standpoint or from an industry standpoint, you're making money from downloads, even if it's just 10 people. But it seems to me like what's happened in the industry is that um, the MP3 is a test drive, man. It's like walking into an auto shop and giving it a spin. And that's basically the first point of purchase. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a customer. It'll take him a little longer to buy your vinyl. So he starts off with the MP3 and then maybe he'll come catch a show or he'll wear a shirt or whatever the case is. Sure. Uh, and I realize, of course, that it's made it a lot tougher for artists. Okay. But what's your perspective on that? My perspective is um, the oh, my main ultimate perspective is that there is no control over it. So I think artists that spend too much time worrying about downloads, um, they're just wasting their energy um, because that's not something you can control. And if you're lucky, like you said, someone is then motivated to go out and buy the record or buy the CD. And th there's something about art where like, there's a quotient of people who feel like it should be public domain right now good point these same people that certainly won't go to work for free you know they won't go to their job and then volunteer their time at this job and then not get paid for it then no one will accept that mm -hmm. right you can't pay your bills right. doing that you know right. so so but they expect artists to just give them their their work their heart and their soul for nothing and so I think that there is and I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with it but I think it's a dichotomy that the working person that downloads maybe doesn't completely understand or grasp you know the way that a band can exist and function is they have to be fed they have to be able to pay rent they have to be able and so maybe they'll go to their day jobs to do that but Yet at the same time, most people on one hand may not want to pay for the art, but on the other hand, they want that artist to succeed. And there's a conflict there, right? Because how does the artist succeed? Does the artist succeed by working 40 or 50 hours and then squeezing in what time they can for art? Or does the artist succeed by being supported to be artists? Mm -hmm. And so, and that's a tough thing, but you know, I don't spend any time um, in any kind of negative feeling about it at all you know 